very awake before lunch, and then after lunch, not so much. <coughs> or if you have to teach teach at a school, teach nothing that matters after lunch <laughs> until like two o'clock. Then usually they kind of get reinvigorated, but maybe if you're lucky, they get reinvigorated. Yeah, I've got mass at 5.30 at my parish. So. Can't thank you enough for coming. Oh, no problem. I'd like, so I said, I'd like to stay a little longer, but I'm going to probably really leave at about 2.45 just to be on the safe side of things in case we get stuck by a truck or something stupid. So. <laughs> All right. We'll go ahead and begin. Do you have to press play on that, or is it already It's been already on. Gone. Oh, great. Okay. We need bloopers. This thing is working, too. All right. So... This morning we talked about putting the first things first, making first things first. Really, the elevating your marriage and your in your life as a family, uh, and, and recognizing that in order to do that, we have to know who we are. We have to know what it means to participate in the image and likeness of God. Uh, to use our intellect and our will to to love each other, uh, and to orient our actions and our thoughts towards each other's goods or towards the good. Um, to recognize also in our lives that we are going to make mistakes, but we need to be able and willing to ask for forgiveness. Uh, we need to be placing ourselves under the headship of Christ uh, as a couple. Um, but in your life as a husband and wife, that you have to practice the art of forgiveness and mercy quite a bit uh, to learn how to pass that on if you have children uh, especially. That you're going to need to work on continuing to clearly communicate your expectations. How do, you, how do you know what each other wants and how do you achieve that? Um, and then there, again, we found that when we clearly communicate our expectations, we find that we're able to live greater unity uh, amongst ourselves as a married couple. So I haven't talked a lot yet about this aspect of marriage, which is your marriage in God, because all of this is really under that kind of broad umbrella. If you're not doing these things with God, you realize how hard life is as a married couple. And I've also talked about the necessity of really human, at a human level, working on your marriage because if things are not good at a human level, it's going to be hard for God to strengthen what is weak, right? There's an axiom in the church that grace perfects nature. Grace builds on nature. That means if our natural life, to the degree that we can say kind of the, nat the nature of us, our natural life, is disordered, if we're bad communicators, if we're selfish, if we're seeking our own pleasure rather than seeking the things of God, then it's hard for God to actually change you, right? But when our, our nature is more perfected, when we're living the life of virtue, then grace can flow abundantly in our lives and change us and continue to transform us in the image and likeness of God. So this afternoon, I'm going to spend a little bit more time focusing on that aspect of your life as a married couple. So here's one of the tragedies of our, again, challenge and tragedy in our culture. A challenge in our culture is kind of this phrase epitomized by the Nike brand, just do it. Right? Just do it. So do whatever makes you feel good. Do that in marriage. It's a recipe for disaster. But at the same time, it's good to just do it if you're really well formed. Because you're going to do the will of God if you're really well formed. And that's going to bring an abundant life and abundance to the life you have with your spouse. But if you're malformed or ill-formed, it's going to bring about destruction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means to be well formed. And then we're going to talk and spend a little bit more time about how you as a couple can kind of help strengthen and perfect that which is needing to be strengthened and perfected in each, in each other. Okay, so already eyes are getting tired. I can see it. Guillermo almost fell asleep. It's okay. 
<laughs> stand up. It's all right. Everybody stand up. Stretch it out. Shake it up. Sir. Sir. Touch the ceiling. <laughs> Touch your toes. I don't know either. I can't get down that far. It's the dress. Yeah, I'm going to say I blame it on the cassock, but it's not really fair. I'm just not flexible. Maybe do some jumping jacks. Yeah, maybe you're too cool. Okay. Yeah, there is coffee. That's also helpful. But at any point, if you're getting kind of tired, stand up and walk around. That's not going to hurt my feelings at all. Um, I know what that's like. So if you want to go ahead and sit down, I'm going to write a few things, or you can keep stretching. Write a few things on the board. try to keep our minds and, and, and bodies engaged. So if you want to form and perfect in your lives the life of virtue so that God truly may sanctify and strengthen your marriage, you're going to need to understand what virtue is. And we, we probably have some basic concept that virtues are these kind of right actions that help us to live the life that God's called us to live. Uh, it's a stable or habitual disposition to the good. Okay, and so there is the extremes that we need to avoid. You can be, for instance, justice is a virtue, right? It's to give another their due. Now, injustice is an extreme where we deny somebody what is their due. Okay, the extreme of justice in the opposite direction is what? Sorry? Giving them everything. And that's actually an injustice also, right? So we need to recognize that there is a, that the virtue is in the middle. To understand what is due and to give that which is due no less, no more, okay? But that's not immediately obvious a lot of times, right? We're not sure quite how much we need to give or we need to, to, to take. So understanding a little bit more about what it means to be virtuous is important that we see the church says in the catechism, for parents particularly it says to bear witness to your children the responsibility of the faith is first by creating a home where tenderness forgiveness respect fidelity and disinterested service are the rule the home is well suited for education in the virtues this requires an apprenticeship and self-denial so in order to live a life of marriage that's under God we have to live a life that includes self-denial so, what are some examples of self-denial in marriage that are normal? I'm overthinking it. Sorry? I'm overthinking it. Yeah, you're, you are going to totally overthink it. Do you always get to eat what you want? No. No. Are you always right? <laughs> no. Even though maybe you are right? <laughs> yeah. You feel attacked. You feel attacked, yeah. Like, no, you're going to be wrong occasionally whether you want to admit it or not. And sometimes, guess what? You have to practice some self-denial about that feeling of righteousness because even if you are possibly right, your wife or your husband is just not seeing it the same way you are, right? And so being compassionate and saying, all right, I don't have to sit here and win this battle uh, for the sake of being right or for the sake of being a winner requires some self-denial but at a much more fundamental level because this is what we're dealing with and we have to sh and we have to admit in America we struggle with a lot we deny ourselves or I'm sorry we struggle with self-denial at a very basic level when it comes to pleasure right 
and I, I, it's hard. I'm not going to harp on Father Bowler too much. But the air conditioner thing, like, he's gotten better about it. He used to get upset if somebody touched his thermostat. Now he, he, he does, but it's not as bad as it used to be. Like, that's legit. It's not as bad as it used to be. He used to kind of fly off the handle when somebody, and now he's like, hey, I put a sign up. Please respect the expectations that I've placed out there, right? But at such a basic level, what I mean by that is how many times a day or how many times a week do you wake up right when your alarm goes off? Never. Almost never, right? Well, and why is that? Because you want to sleep more. Because you want to sleep more. Because you're tired. Right. You have four kids. You got three kids. Okay. Did your kids keep you up until 11:30 p.m.? Yes. I believe in y'all's case. Okay. You have teenagers. Us? Not yeah. Not yet. So you have preteens. You have preteens. We've got little kids. Right. They kick, they kick you in the back and make life a little bit challenging. But overwhelmingly keep recessing here because I, I know how this goes. My sister gave me all the excuses. <laughs> Ultimately, that comes to a lack down to a lack of self-discipline. If you have the discipline to put your kids in bed at 8 o'clock, they might scream and cry until 8.30 or 8.45, but they'll go to bed. Eventually, they will fall asleep. And then you don't have to deal with them at 9.30 and 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock because they're asleep. Or they're going bat poop crazy. <laughs> And you just don't do anything about it because guess what? They will learn to stop screaming. They really will. But it comes down to, am I willing to sacrifice that moment of ease and pleasure right now so that later on tonight I can get a full six or seven hours of sleep, right? So it's going to suck in the moment because the seven-year-old the seven -year -old is going to say, you're a terrible father, right? I hate you. That's the words we hate hearing the most from our kids. I hate you. Well, you know they're irrational and stupid. And they're going to say irrational and stupid things that mean nothing, that they're going to forget about 10 minutes later, 90% of the time. But how is it that you are modeling self-discipline so that your children are seeing that self-discipline? So self-denial is first and foremost, really we think about this in our culture today, is about denying pleasure and that can be physical or psychological again I'm I'm not a psychologist I've just been around people my whole life um, and I hear confessions so I kind of hear the backside of some of these stories right and not to pick on our big family but with 10 people in a family there are a lot of dynamics that are very challenging that I don't begin to understand but one that I do understand about big families, because I am around them a fair amount, is that this becomes, this denying of pleasure, this typically becomes, a pleasure becomes a high priority in terms of your psychological well-being, right? You want to feel contentment. We all want to feel contentment. Um, but we play this little negotiation game where each day, Brian and, and Charity is going to try to do something to make Anna's life easier. And Anna's going to do something to make your life easier. And are those things massively bad? No. But the less, or I'm sorry, the more you chip away at having some discipline, the more you're setting yourself up for failure, right? And you know that. Like you're talking about, you like you keep a pretty healthy diet. Like you, you give yourself a cookie today and tomorrow and the next day, and then you're eating a sleeve of Oreos without even realizing it, right? And maybe, for me, it's not the temptation. Like, my temptation is steak and cheese. Like, I love savory food. So I have to really kind of actually exercise some self-discipline and say, no, I'm, because generally speaking, I don't have a wife. I mean, I don't have a wife who's going to tell me no. My brother priest is not going to generally say no to me. My people are, despite, you know, how big or small I get, are always going to say, Father, you look great, right? So having some sense of self-discipline and say, you know what? I've already had, you know, a hamburger and steak today. I don't need another steak. You know, I have to fight that temptation. But when we make the negotiation for our physical or psychological needs constant, we're breaking down in ourselves the ability for God to actually transform us. Because at a natural level, level we're so susceptible to physical and psychological fulfillment, right? 
So with ladies, it tends to be much more of a struggle on the psychological side. And don't get me wrong, physical fulfillment is important, um, but you tend to make negotiations of, of, dis of a disciplinary uh, nature with your psychological sense of well-being, right? So you're willing to engage in activities uh, that you know bring about some kind of maybe psychological contentment, like the reading of you know mildly pornographic literature or watching shows that <clears throat> probably you know you shouldn't be watching or engaging in conversations. That's probably the bigger one is engaging in conversations that bring you some sense of contentment, but they're also sinful. Right? Here, go back to the example of gossiping. Gossiping is sinful. It may bring you a sense of power over other people because you know something now that they, that they may not know. It may bring you some sense of authority over other people because you have more, like you, Vanessa, working with Father Boland, you probably know more about the church than a lot of other people do. And the temptation can become for you to be, oh, well, I'm the, the gatekeeper um, and not deny or and not practicing self-discipline, you're just telling everybody everything, right? And that becomes a problem. Like, so you have to exercise some psychological self-discipline so that God is able to, again, transform those things in you which are lacking or that are weak. So part of us offering to God a good natural foundation for grace to work on us is practicing self-discipline. And physical pleasure and psychological pleasure are the things that we tend to gravitate towards the most, and we need to work on denying those needs. So if there's an area in your life where you know this is just the case, like I'm not good at denying myself this thing, you need to communicate that with your spouse and ask them to pray for you and kind of help hold you accountable. And that's the hard part, is at the end of the week, Alex, when Tiffany says, hey, how many times did you get a... Uh, what are those called, like a four loco or monster, I don't know if that's your thing construction dudes, you know Brian, drink that stuff like co it's cocaine, it's so bad full yeah, full throw, it's so bad like we have no idea how bad but we can clearly tell the amount of taurine that people are consuming is not good for their bodies, right, but, but something that simple, right, it seems kind of crazy, but just say hey instead of drinking $45 worth of energy drinks every week. Can we cut it down to $10 worth of energy drinks? Have a water. Well, I know. Yeah, I mean, literally, I walk around with this thing all the time. But learning to practice that self-discipline, it does lead, actually, in a very practical way. Okay, you've learned to deny yourself something that's simple. Okay, when the Lord, you know, Lent comes around and it's like, oh, I'm going to give up chocolate. No, how about you give up cussing? That's a lot harder. Yes. About anybody can give up chocolate for 40 days. Congratulations. You want a gold star? Um, <laughs> sorry, I can give up chocolate. Did God just like, wake you up today and say, here, hold up this mirror? Do you see? Oh, no. But, <laughs> <laughs> again, I hear confessions, so I kind of know, know what happens. But the idea that, okay, I can do that, but can I do something that's really going to give God more space in my life? Like, for me, I'm not, I, I don't have social media. That's not really my, my issue. Um, I like to read and not always like, like I'm not reading bad stuff but I'll read stupid books like I'm reading I've been reading a book about the invention of the wheel that's not stupid but, need that. but yeah but do I need to read it like <laughs> I'm not sleep no right and that's the problem is like <laughs> once I pick it up I'm I'm struggling to put it down so I'm one chapter each day instead of reading like the whole book in one sitting because that could happen because I just love reading um, but Give it, because what do I need to spend more time on, Alex, than reading about wills? I need to spend more time praying, first and foremost, and maybe preparing for my homily. You know, and I can still read a chapter about the will, but do I need to know everything about it? No, not all at once. So little acts of self-denial help us to be more receptive to God working in our lives. The next thing that the catechism suggests, this is number 2223, and it's in the context of raising a family, but it's you are a family, is an apprenticeship in sound judgment. So, do any of y'all help with sacramental formation for kids getting ready for confirmation? Anybody here? No, okay. Sorry? You kind of, you're supposed to, as parents, you are the first teachers of the faith. Um, but 
one of the, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, anybody know the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? Victor, you know the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes, maybe. Susie, you look more confident than Victor does. Yes, knowledge. Yep. Understanding. Yep. Wisdom. Yep. Right judgment. Yep. Counsel. Counsel. Uh, You're doing great. Courage. Yep. Fortitude. Fortitude, perseverance. Yeah. Um, awe of God. Yep. Is that it? Piety oh. and, and so fortitude, courage, perseverance. It's fortitude is kind of listed class, but good job. Susie did a really good job. I mean, to know seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, not an easy thing to do, but wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and counsel all have to do with what? Intellect. Your intellect. Piety, fortitude, and fear of God have to do with what? Your will, your will or your heart. Yeah. So we tend to not think about asking. We think, oh, kids will get the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but just kids at confirmation, no. At baptism, you re you're sealed in the Holy Spirit. At confirmation, you're anointed, and then at confirmation, you're sealed. These gifts are ever persevering in you if you're open <coughs> to receiving them. But these particular intellectual gifts that come through confirmation help us with sound judgment. Now, why is sound judgment such an important part of having a life and a relationship with God? Have any of you ever read about the miracle of the Cinnamon Toast Crunch? No? Yeah, like Mary shows up in a bowl of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. You know that stuff's fake, right? And it doesn't actually get you to heaven. But people become fascinated with it, okay? There are many miracles that have happened and have been approved that are glorious. All the Eucharistic miracles that are approved, uh, all the Marian apparitions like Guadalupe. I've been to Guadalupe 12 times. I've seen the Tilma a lot. I absolutely believe that's truly happened, that 500 years ago, that image appeared on the Tilma. What if I didn't believe that? Would I go to hell? No. You don't have to believe the Tilma is a true miracle to, to go to heaven. It really helps because she's awesome. Guadalupe is our mom and she loves us. But we have the real temptation to make a lot of judgments that are not very sound. And what happens when we start to convince ourselves of our own judgments as being sound or true? We're not, we're not putting our faith in the Lord, we're putting it in ourselves and man. Correct. You are starting to convince yourself that you are God. And that's a problem because you're not, and I'm not either. Thanks be to God, right? Um, and we can make mistakes in terms of knowledge, for example. How many of you are bio virologists? Nobody. How many of you have a strong opinion about vaccinations? Pretty much everybody, right? In some form or another, right? And that's okay. We can learn a lot, right? I'm not a virologist. I can learn. I did. I prayed about it. I read about it. I studied it, and I made a decision. I don't think that's the best decision for me to get this shot, okay? Great. If somebody else makes another decision, that's their choice. Again, these are things that are not going to get us to heaven or, or send us to hell, right? But if I'm formed in solid or sound judgment, I can make those discerning questions. If I'm stupid or if I'm blindly trusting or if I don't think for myself critically, then I'm not going to be making sound judgments because y'all have probably said this to some of your kids when they did something wrong with their friends. Maybe this is my parents would always say, well, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do that too? Right? You're, something like, you're going to say something like that to your kids at some point. You're like, Mom, no, I'm not going to jump off the bridge. But you did hit that joint. You did smoke that joint with your buddy. And that's all that it was, was peer pressure, right? But sound judgment would teach me to not smoke the joint and jump off the bridge, right? But if I have, don't have sound judgment, I'm going to make a bad decision. And we're going to make bad decisions. We're going to make mistakes. But why does the church insist that this is part of having a good foundation to have a right relationship with God? Well, again, our intellect is engaged all the time during our lives. And as spouses particularly, you know when to bring up a conversation and not to bring up what you should. Be able to discern and make that kind of conversation happen, right? If it's been a long work week and all of a sudden you're tempted to attack your husband 
about something he did last Sunday that made you upset, is that a good time to have that conversation? That's, oh, Tiffany's like, yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> because Tiffany, yeah, then the next 48 hours, you and Alex are going to be fighting about something that happened seven days ago, right? So sound judgment is going to lead us to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, and should we say it at all? That's part of the counsel. Sometimes it's not worth having that argument because it's really not worth having that argument. And these are all things you have to kind of keep in mind and balance through the use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But God will infuse you with this grace to make better judgments and prepare you in your life as a married couple. Because the fights you have, like for the most part, 99.9% .9 of the time, you know that you're going to reconcile. It may be tough, but you're going you're gonna to work it out. When you piss your kid off really bad for the first time and they have the ability to leave you and abandon you, that's a lot scarier, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have good judgment to realize, is this the time that I hit that kind of inflection point with my kid or not? Is this the time I bring up that really difficult truth that may mean that we're, we're in a cold war for the next six months where she doesn't talk to me or he doesn't talk to me? And we're talking about your kids who are going to live under your roof regardless of how much they hate you until they can emancipate themselves, right? <clears throat> but your spouse deserves that same consideration. Should I have this kind of conversation or should I not at this point in time? Sound judgment helps us with that. And the point is that Christ will help you in your judgments if you practice sound judgment on your own. The last point of this section of this talk is that we have to practice self-mastery, which is the, it calls the precondition of true freedom. So if you are a person with great self-mastery, what does that mean? What's another way of saying that? You're accomplished? No. You know yourself? You know yourself, yeah. You know your limitations, your strengths, your weaknesses, and all those things that help you to be who you are. How many of us can say that about ourselves? You feel mostly confident, you have a sense of who you are, awesome. How did you get to that point? And I mean that sincerely. self-analysis, yeah. looking at how does my intellect and my will correspond with my dignity as a human being, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, we, we've got to know ourselves. And so temperamentally, we've got to know ourselves. Are we, you know, people who are really easily annoyed? Are we people who are highly emotional? Are we people who are phlegmatic? That's one of the temperaments, you know, or are we sanguine? You know, to, to, to kind of do some of these basic psychological things is really helpful to know our, our kind of personality characteristics for good or for ill we need to know who we are like a couple of my female friends that have been adult friends for a long time it's always not always but often say father i love you because you're so boring I'm like well i don't know if that's really a compliment what do you mean you don't really get excited or you know i i'm very calm you know it could be kind of the worst day of my life or it could be the best day of my life i'm not not particularly sad or happy. I'm just like, no, this is great. I generally have a fundamental disposition of che cheerfulness. Like I would be considered an optimist mostly. Like, you know, yeah, it's hot outside, but at least the sun's out. That's a good thing, right? So in my boringness, I have a tremendous amount of emotional stability. However, there are two things that make me act like an irrational, insane person very easily. When a man tells me or a woman tells me that their husband has abused them. If you touch a kid or you touch a, a touch a woman, I want to punch you in the face and rip your head off. And I can lose it very quickly when those things occur uh, or I hear about them. So when I watch the news, if it's talking about abuse of children, I'll change the channel because I just don't need my blood to boil like that. Or if it's about a man who's you know, been physically assaulting his wife, that's one thing. And abortion is the second thing. And really, the two are so intimately connected that, that it's pretty obvious why. I, I, I truly lose my mind 
thinking about how many millions of babies are dead right now because of our selfishness, okay? But other than that, I'm, I'm pretty much always even killed, okay? I know that about myself. That means when I go to abortion, you know, go to a, like I've been to the pro-life marches and I've had people throw rocks at me and call me all kinds of names. I'm okay with them being mad at me because I'm defending the most defenseless people in the world. And that's right and just, okay? But if I'm at some other point in life going to have rocks and stuff thrown at me, I don't know that I'll be as passionate. I don't know if I'd be passionate to go somewhere where somebody's going to throw rocks at me. You know, there's pretty few things that are going to make me that excited. Um, but when we learn ourselves, so we learn about what makes us tick, and that's an important thing to understand. Men and women need to understand what is it that upsets you the easiest or the most. Um, and identifying that with your spouse, you know, if it's something like, thinking about my sister and my brother-in-law, uh, Nicole and Travis, the one with six kids, uh, the way their house dynamic is, my brother-in-law likes to not have to share a bathroom with anybody. Sound familiar? I think generally men don't like sharing bathrooms with other people because we know ourselves and we know we're gross. Uh, you know, maybe that's it. But also it's like, I don't want 15 other people's soap in my bathroom. Um, and my brother-in-law and <laughs> Brian, I just see you and Anna are like, yep, that's us in a nutshell. Like he just wants to take, he, if he could have his own bathroom, that's it. Oh, he, he would be in love. He would just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have two bathrooms. So yeah. Okay, for 10 people, that's, that's rough. Yeah. Okay, like, so. All four girls are used to coming to ours to get ready. And that's really the thing. Because you didn't know that there were 10 types of shampoo and conditioner. Like, I, I literally did. I, I thought it was always two in one, head and shoulders. Now it's three in one. I mean, you can literally, but all of it does this. It's all a chemical anyway. So. But, yeah, you're just over or inundated by why are there so many options and why can't I just, I just want to look at the ground and not see bottles, right? But, in a sense, we have to have a sense of what does set us off. So, yeah, you can't do anything about it right now. But... But what's a little thing that could help is maybe the 14-year-old doesn't spill her shampoo every day in the shower. Like, that's a conversation to have because you know it sets you off, right? And you're better able to control your temper because you've had that conversation with the 14-year-old and said, hey, please do this so that I don't lose my, you know, crap every time I, I go in to take a shower. But self-mastery is going to help you better do that, as, and particularly as adults, um, you have to set that example. So if you struggle with something, you need to understand you struggle with that thing and work on addressing it. Because really, overwhelmingly, emotional stability is a massively important thing for your kids, God willing, that you have or that, you are, that you're gonna have. But also it's important for your spouse. Tiffany, think about how much nicer it is to know what sets Alex off, right? So you kind of know when to, when to not push those buttons, even though you know those buttons can be pushed, which would be vicious, and you need to go to confession, right? I mean, seriously, you would. But you don't learn that. It's not like a manual that's written that says these are the things that are going to piss him off. You've got to ask those questions. It's a little bit of his trial and error. You do learn that you do things that frustrate each other. But self-mastery is going to teach you not to do that because you don't want to make your spouse sin. And that's what happens when you don't really know each other and you don't know yourself is you're going to cause each other to sin quite a bit. And it's hard for God to work on perfecting you because you are so in, unworried about your own perfection at a human level. That just doesn't make sense. So does that all make sense for now? This yeah. is just mostly about self-denial, self-mastery, and judgment. This is so that you can have a better relationship with each other, but more importantly, a better relationship with God. And God is gonna perfect those imperfections in you, but you, he does expect you to work with his grace, right? Rather than just saying, okay, God, magically make me better, you're saying, no, I'm gonna work on making myself better and cooperating with God in that process. So, I wanna talk a little bit about, finally, the need for, in your life as a married couple, the need for you to Place God in the right order of your relationship with your spouse, with your children, and with the world. Um, and 
remember the title of the first talk was First Things First, but and I talked about the need for you to work on your marriage because this is a day oriented towards your marriage and the marriage enrichment, right? That's presuming, and I presume this because I know your pastor and I know he's a good man and a good priest. That's presuming you have a relationship with God. Because if you don't have a relationship with God, it doesn't matter how much you try to make your relationship with your spouse work, it ultimately will fail because you, you are oriented towards yourself and you're not oriented towards God and others. So we want to talk a little bit about what marriage and the relationship with God looks like because there's a few problems that I want to address and then a few good things that I hope to help. So the first we're going to talk about is the, the problems. Problems of prayer and marriage. First problem is everybody's problem is time, right? Father, I don't have enough time to pray. How many times have you confessed that in your life? I mean, I think I confessed it last time. I went to confession like two days ago. I was like, oh, I don't have enough time to pray. Why not? Why not? We don't know. So yeah. This series just got really good. Yeah, the series that, that whatever you're watching on Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or whatever just got really awesome. The phone right? and the internet. The phone and the internet, yeah. Lazy. Lazy. Social media. We just named all of our gods, right? Yeah. Because we're not supposed to love anything above God, but we've named all those things that we prioritize over God. And they came pretty quickly. We all know them. Right? We all kind of know our natural in the natural enemies of our supernatural life. Um, and you didn't, none of you actually said the devil. Notice that. None of you said the reason you're not praying up is because of the devil. Now, don't get me wrong. The devil hates you and wants to see you miserable. But he doesn't have to work real hard. No, because he's using those other things. He is, but he's not even having, he doesn't have to use them. That's the thing. We can choose whether or not we're going to engage in those things. He might subtly twist our mind a little bit here and there, but overwhelmingly, the devil doesn't have to do much. It's left to our own devices without God. We're pretty lazy, pretty selfish, and we're going to live that way, right? So time is the biggest issue in terms of a life of prayer and marriage. Now, as individuals, you need to have a prayer life. That's not something you do with your spouse. Does everybody understand that? Do you agree with that? Is there any question of why that's important? Do you individually have a prayer life? So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, that, but I want to make sure it's at least obvious to you. An individual prayer life is not going to look the same for everybody. And frankly, most of you that are parents especially, your prayer life is not going to have hours in a week. Probably going to have maybe an hour of mass, Maybe you can squeeze in a daily mass occasionally, right? But you do have 15 to 30 minutes every day, without question. I don't care how busy you say you are. You have 15 to 30 minutes a day that you're wasting doing something else. So as an individual, you really need to focus on that 15 to 30 minutes of individual prayer every day. I think that's not unreasonable at all. Whether you've got no kids or you got six kids or you got eight kids. Why? Because the most important relationship you have is the one you have with God. If that one is rightly ordered and if that one is working, guess what? Your spouse and you are going to get along better. You're going to be more patient. You and your kids are going to get on, get on phenomenally better, and that's really important because you're going to love them and you're going to see what's actually loving for them, right? You're not going to negotiate with the terrorist. You're going to love the terrorist and actually give the terrorist what they need versus what they want. But 15 to 30 minutes of prayer is not crazy for an individual adult to have, even in the midst of a busy family life. But that means that you as spouses need to negotiate and talk about when is that possible and what can I do to help you achieve that? That's love. You know, 
willing the good of the other, putting their good before everything else. So I would say, in terms of priorities, you've got to help each other to have phenomenal prayer lives as individuals. Now here's the thing with married, married life and prayer. You got to teach your kids how to pray, right? Church will help, but you got to teach your kids how to pray. But I know what it's like to pray a rosary with a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. It sucks. They're insane. They're throwing things. They're screaming the Ave Maria, and you know you're trying to teach them it in Latin, and Spanish, and English, or whatever. And it's just, it's all crazy, right? So why don't you just pray a decade of the rosary together? Why don't you pray three Hail Marys together? slowly as a family. You can do that. You can do that after your meal. It doesn't have to, I mean, hopefully you can get to the habit and where they're old enough and they'll actually join you to pray part of the rosary or, or to pray, you know, scripture more often with you. But be realistic, guys. Have realistic expectations. Remember, go back to that. Unrealistic expectations are premeditated resentments. And when you have a realistic expectation or desire in terms of the prayer life of you and your kids particularly I'm talking particularly to people with kids especially that doesn't mean you're going to be able to pray a whole decade every night even maybe you get it in four nights a week good job keep trying and the more it becomes habitual the more they'll do it and it's with less and less fuss um, but if you don't do it at all you have nobody to blame but yourself now, if you're married and you don't have kids, or if you're married and you're at an age where your kids don't live in your home anymore, um, and even for those of you who are married and do have kids, this is a little exercise that I want you to practice, and so it's something you do need to practically write down. Um, at least once a week, sessions with each other so you know at mass we have the uh, intercessions after the creed you know like we pray for the church that it evangelizes the world with the gospel we pray to the Lord Lord hear our prayer or, 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 or those intercessions are universal generally in their nature right but what happens when Maria and Eduardo Start once a week, maybe, on Sunday night, Maria says out loud what she's feeling in her heart that she needs God's help with. Well, guess who else learned what's in Maria's heart that day? Eduardo. And guess what Eduardo can do? He can pray for her for the next seven days about those specific things. And then Eduardo can open his mouth and say, you know, mi amor, you know, this is my, these are the things I'm, that I need you to pray for. It's simple. And it doesn't have to be long. That could take two minutes. It might take 20. Because it might turn into a conversation. We're like, oh, I didn't know that was going on. This sometimes happens. Particularly for couples who have a, a busy life. It's hard to know what's important or what's stressing you out. Because everything's kind of, there's a low level stress you're always existing in, right? That's fair. I know, parents. It is, it's, it's true. But you kind of get used to a lot of it, and it's just it's part of life. But what are the things you're really worried about? You're really worried about the 11-year-old who came to you the other day and had their period. And that's like five-alarm crap. And it's not just that they're physically changing. It's that they're going through a lot of emotional issues. So you all need to be praying for your daughter together, even though your daughter may have not talked to you about the fact that she's on her period, right? Or your son got caught cheating at school or something like you know that's not always bad things either it could just be like hey we we one intercession that you should pray together is you know praying for and asking the lord to just continue to bless you as you give thanks for the blessings you've received you know say lord thank you lord and please continue to bless us and shower us with your protection that's okay too but if you're not expressing these things with each other already a great place to do that, to open that, that veil of secrecy, so to speak, of your heart, is to open that veil in intercessions with each other. 
that makes sense? And again, this doesn't have to be long. It doesn't, and you can do it more often. If you, some couples do this every night, and I, that's great. It may not be your thing. It may be easy, and, and you can finish it or begin it with an Our Father or a Hail Mary. But and you don't have to say those prayers if you don't want to. You can just say, "Hey, before you go to before y'all go to bed, say what what should we pray for, guys? It's that simple. What should we pray for?" And you may have to lead and say, "I you know I'm praying because work has been kicking my butt, or I'm mad at my boss, or whatever, whatever it is. But whatever is really, you need to get to the point where you're not just saying pray for good weather. Well, it's always good to pray for good weather. Don't get me wrong, but to have more intentional you know vulnerability in that. Does that make sense? All right. So problems, first is the prayer, is the time issue. People say I don't have time. You do have time. You just got to make it a priority. And then learning how to do that as a couple is working on once, having once a week time of intercession. Okay. Sorry, I lost my pen here. The second problem we have in this is that, this is the unspoken truth, but You forget to pray for your spouse. You forget to pray for your spouse. John, you were sharing with me that your, your mother kind of suffered the effects of dementia. Right? You prayed for her like crazy, I imagine, when that happened. Did you pray for your mom every day before then? Oh, no. No. You just kind of take, not because you're a bad kid either. We just tend to take for granted the people we love the most, right? You do that every, y'all do that to each other all the time. It's one of the worst things about married couples. They forget that this is the person who completes you. <laughs> this is the person who God created for you from the beginning of time to help you get to heaven. But we tend to really forget to pray for our spouse because. You're going to pray for your kids. You're going to pray for your, you know, the sick sibling. Whatever disaster and humanity and humanitarian crisis exists, we're praying for you all day. Still, I hope and pray that y'all are praying for that poor community that was so affected by what happened. We'll do that, but then the person you go to bed next to every night, have you prayed for them? Have you really gotten on your knees and, and prayed for that person? gone to Mass and offered, you know, your reception of Holy Communion for your spouse. We tend not to. It's not because you're terrible human beings, by the way. We just don't think about it. We really don't think about it. We think about everything else, but we, think, but we forget to think about the person who we love the most. Right? So praying for your spouse doesn't mean that you have to do some extraordinary act of prayer. It could be. Um, could be fasting for your spouse. Maybe that would be something you could do more often is to deny yourself, uh, you know, again, if it's cookies that you're addicted to, to deny yourself some cookies. But your intention of I'm praying for my spouse and this self-denial needs to be there. I'm praying for my spouse's health. I'm praying for my spouse's uh, mental health because they've been, you know, really depressed lately, whatever it may be. But prayer and sacrifice are things you need to be doing for your spouse particularly. Now, don't show me your hands, but I just want you to think about this real quick. When's the last time you prayed by name for the person that you're married to? Just think about that. Okay. Just thought about it. How many of us did it yesterday? One, two of you. Three of you. Okay. So, again, you're not bad people. Don't, don't feel bad. It's not about fe making anybody feel bad. But think about that. If three out of, what are there, 16 of you, I think, or something to that effect, uh, here, maybe 12 of y'all, um, then we got to work on making that percentage a little bit higher, right? Hopefully we can make that percentage a little bit higher. How's that going to affect you? Well, what affects you praying for each other, whether you realize it or not, is that you're building up the kingdom of God in your family, which is going to, in turn, build up the kingdom of God in this community and is in turn going to build up the community for the kingdom of God in all of this area, not just in this parish community.